Um, so I'll be talking about a new computational analog of entropy uh, and its applications in cryptography. Uh, this is uh, joint work with Iftak Hitner, Omer Weingold, and uh, Hotek Lee. Okay, so I'll start with a just quick review of what we need to know about entropy uh, for the purposes of this uh, talk. Uh, then I'll talk about uh, something that's uh, fairly well understood uh, by now, but it'll be useful in setting context uh, for what we do. Uh, and that is the relationship between secrecy sort of conditions in cryptography and another computational analog of entropy known as pseudo-entropy. And then I'll talk about um, other kinds of security conditions in cryptography, unforgeability kind of conditions, and that will lead us to our new notion of inaccessible entropy, and then we'll see, um, spend a little bit of time on applications as uh, time permits. Okay, so what do we need to know about entropy for this talk? So. Um, uh, for the most part, we'll be talking about uh, Shannon entropy. So Shannon entropy of random variable. You take the expectation over samples of uh, the random variable, of log of the reciprocal of the probability mass. Uh, sorry, the constant come out. So these are this is a left arrow to indicate uh, sample from the distribution. Um, <clears throat> we won't be working need need to work much in the talk with the, with the formal definition. You can just informally. Think of this as a measure of the number of bits of randomness in the, in the random variable capital X here on average. So think of this as the randomness in the individual sample, and then we're taking the expectation of that. Um, so at its, uh, it ranges can be it's, uh, from zero, and the largest can be as log of the size of the support of the random variable. Here, all logs are base two. At these two extremes, um, kind of, it has a qualitative meaning. At, the, at zero, it just means that x, the random variable, is concentrated on a point, and at the <coughs> large, it, it uh, achieves a quality on the other extreme, if and only if the random variable is uniform on its support. And so for a lot of the time, we'll just be talking about these two qualitative extremes, but then it'll be useful and important for us to have a more quantitative measure in between. Okay, and then we'll also talk about conditional entropy of two jointly distributed random variables, x and y. The entropy of x given y, you just take the average over samples of y of the entropy of x condition, the conditional distribution of x um, uh, given that sample. Um, this satisfies the nice uh, chain rule that entropy in two random variables, x and y, is entropy in y plus the entropy of x given y. Um, conditioning can only reduce entropy, so the entropy of x given y is at most the entropy of x. Uh, that holds with equality if and only if x and y are independent. And the most that conditioning on y can reduce entropy is by its own entropy. And that holds uh, if and only if y is a function of x. And uh, another extreme, this is also always non-negative and kind of follows from the thing we said before about when Shannon entropy is zero, that the entropy of x given y is zero, and x has no entropy given y, has no entropy left uh, given y, if and only if it's completely determined by y. x is a function of y. Okay, um, so I mentioned that we should think of Shannon entropy as, as randomness on average. There are also worst case notions, analogs of Shannon entropy that, are, that we'll refer to but not really work with much in the talk. Um, mean entropy where you replace the expectation with a minimum. This just means you look at the heaviest element according to the distribution. And then uh, something that's maybe less well known, uh, max entropy, which corresponds to just that upper bound on Shannon entropy we talked about before, um, just log of the size of the support. So the Shannon entropy is, is, is sandwiched between the, the min entropy and the, and the max entropy. So saying the min entropy is high is, is a strong way of saying the random variable has a lot of entropy. And saying the, the support size is small is a strong way of saying it has small uh, entropy. OK, so now on to talking about um, what entropy has to do uh, with cryptography. Um, and this really goes all the way back to the sort of classic works of Shannon. Um, who gave the first mathematically rigorous uh, treatment of uh, cryptography and security. Um, uh, so, um, and he gave us a very nice definition of, uh, you have an encryption scheme here. Here we're talking about uh, private key encryption. Um, and uh, he defined an encryption scheme uh, to have uh, perfect uh, secrecy if for every two messages, m and m prime, say we're encrypting n bit strings here, the encryption of m has the same distribution as the encryption of m prime. This is not the way he defined it, but it's equivalent uh, uh, to his definition. And here, the randomness is coming over the choice of a, a random key, k, capital letters uh, denoting uh, random variables. 
Um, and this is only capturing security for one application of the encryption. It doesn't talk about when you encrypt uh, 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 many times. Um, and uh, this is a very nice, very strong definition, but what Shannon unfortunately showed is it has a severe limitation that if you want to encrypt n-bit messages, your key must be of length at least n. Okay, and so, if you, and, and if you're encrypting many times, your, your key length has to be as long as the total number of messages, bits that you're encrypting, and so it, it's uh, not really a um, practically uh, achievable notion. Okay, so I want to review very quickly um, Shannon's proof of this um, using entropy um, because it will also just help motivate things that come later. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so imagine um, now to, to prove this, we have this encryption scheme. Um, imagine we encrypt a uniformly random message M, which is a random, uniformly random N bit string and encrypt it and look at the joint distribution of, of that message together with this encryption. Well, what perfect secrecy says is that the encryption's distribution is independent, doesn't depend at all, it's the same for all messages. So that means that these two are actually independent of each other. That is, it has the same distribution if I took a, chose an independent uniform n-bit string, which is you know, by use of n, it's together with the encryption of m. And as a result, if I look now at the conditional entropy of m given the encryption, it's the same as the conditional entropy of, of this uniform distribution, uh, which is just uh, n, right? So just using this qualitative high high end extreme of uh, entropy. On the other hand, the fact that you can decrypt means that if I'm given the encryption of a message and the key, the message is completely determined. So that means that the ent entropy of M given the encryption, its encryption and the key is zero. And now since conditioning on the key can reduce entropy by at most the entropy of the key, we get that the entropy of the key is at least, or the, uh, sorry, the entropy of M given the encryption is, is at most the entropy of the key. Right? And so then putting these two together, you have the entropy of the key is at least N, and hence the key must be of length at least N. Okay, so um, that's uh, Shannon, uh, and uh, <clears throat> The fundamental realization that came in the, in the 70s uh, that enabled bypassing this, this severe limitation um, that uh, Shannon showed was the realization that we don't really need uh, perfect uh, security. It suffices for us to have security against feasible adversaries, the ones who run, say, in polynomial time. Um, and uh, taking this sort of computational perspective um, leads to the, the following computational analog of, of Shannon's uh, definition of secrecy, computational secrecy of uh, Goldwasser and Macaulay, um, where instead of requiring that the encryption of any two messages have the same distribution, we just require that these distributions are computationally indistinguishable. That is, no feasible, say, polynomial time algorithm can distinguish a random sample of one from a random sample of the other, except with negligible probability. And this allows us to have a key length much shorter than the length of the messages we're encrypting. So it may be informative to see where, where is it that Shen's uh, proof breaks down. Um, well, it's here in the first step. So when we have com uh, only computational secrecy instead of perfect secrecy, um, then all we can say is that the message, when we look at the encryption of a random, uh, uniformly random message, is indistinguishable from the uniform distribution given the encryption. And so, Instead of we can say we can't say that its entropy is n given the, the its encryption, but only that in some sense it looks like it has entropy n given its encryption. All right. So uh, qualitatively, we can think of this as saying that the message has pseudo entropy um, n uh, given the distribution. Right now, I'm just using this uh, informally. In a moment, we'll see a, a more general quantitative definition of pseudo entropy. All right. And the key realization, key point. Um, is that it is possible to have um, distributions whose pseudo-entropy is much larger than their actual entropy. Okay, so for example, if I take the output of a, of a pseudo-random generator on a short k-bit c, it's, um, the real entropy of its output on a random seed is um, at most k, the length of the seed, but it's indistinguishable from the uniform distribution. That's the definition of a pseudo-random generator. And so its pseudo-entropy is n. And so if it stretches by a lot, um, its pseudo-entropy is much larger than its actual entropy. 
Okay, so what's the more general quantitative notion of, of uh, before going into this quantitative, and one more thing I want to point out here is that there's a sort of an asymmetry here between the honest parties and the adversary. So this talking when we talk about secrets here, this is really from the perspective of the adversary, the, the message looks like it computationally has n bits of entropy given the encryption, but from the honest party's perspective, we're really in the second case because to the honest parties, uh, they can see that the message has, uh, uh, doesn't have much entropy uh, given the encryption because they, can, they have the key and given the key and the encryption, they can compute the message. Um, so this point, this sort of asymmetry will also come up, the kind of asymmetry will come up um, when we talk about our uh, computational notion of entropy. All right, so now what's a more general quantitative notion of uh, pseudo-entropy? This was given by Hassad and Polyevs 11 and Luby. Um, they defined a random variable x to have pseudo-entropy at least k if it is x is computationally indistinguishable from some random variable y um, whose uh, real entropy is at least k. Okay. Um, so... <clears throat> Uh, one thing to note is that I'm only defining this as a kind of lower bound, so I'm saying pseudo-entropy is at least k, and we'll come back to why I, I only think this definition is only useful for saying kind of entropy is high, we'll come back to that later. Um, okay, so this is a nice definition, but uh, what is it good for? Um, well, it was a, a key concept in the celebrated result by Hassad et al, uh, that uh, pseudo-random generators can be constructed from any one-way function. That they can be based on uh, the sort of minimal uh, complexity, the minim minimal assumption for complexity-based cryptography. That you have a function that's easy to compute in the forward direction, um, but hard to invert. And the way their proof goes, just uh, schematically, is the first step from their one from a one-way function. They show how to build a random variable where whose pseudo-entropy is slightly larger than its actual entropy. All right? They construct a random, uh, in effect, in one that you can sam sample efficiently in polynomial time, um, in a variable x, pseudo-entropy, so it's indistinguishable from some random variable who, y, whose entropy is bigger than the entropy of x plus some tiny amount, noticeable amount, one over a polynomial. Then the next step is they take many repetitions, uh, many independent copies of x, and what this does is it increases the gap from being small, just one over polynomial, to being large, at a large additive polynomial gap in bits of entropy. And uh, additionally, it has a nice effect of turning this average case notions uh, of, of Shannon entropy into the worst case notion, so you actually get x has pseudo-min entropy um, that's large, uh, and even larger than its, than it, than its max entropy. All right, I'm cheating a little bit here. I'm ignoring some negligible statistical distance uh, that, that uh, comes in. And then by some um, uh, hashing, they're able to convert the pseudo-min entropy, right, having x having large, being indistinguishable from having large min entropy to being indistinguishable from the uniform distribution, okay? And the fact that it has a small max entropy, small support size, into having a short seed. Okay, and that's exactly what you want from a pseudo-random generator. Okay, so that's all, uh, nothing new. Um, um, so now in the, the rest of the talk, I want to use to talk about um, a different kind of uh, notion of uh, computational entropy. Okay, so... Um, really, the starting point is that uh, cryptography is not just about uh, secrecy conditions. Um, and in particular, there are many security conditions of cryptography that have a, have a, sort of a di different kind of uh, flavor, which we will see is in some sense complementary, um, which are sometimes referred to as unforgeability conditions, um, where instead of, we're saying, instead of saying that there's information that's hidden from an adversary, so what secrecy is about, we, these conditions say that it is hard for the adversary to do something without being caught. Uh, in particular, it's hard for ad an adversary to generate um, valid looking messages when it's, when it's not supposed to be able to. All right? So, examples are um, unforgeability conditions of digital signature schemes or, or their private key analog message authentication codes. Here, if, the, if someone doesn't possess a signing key, it shouldn't be able to uh, uh, generate messages 
um, together with uh, signatures or, or maps that, uh, uh, that are valid, that fool the honest parties into thinking they're valid. Um, another property is collision resistance of hash functions and binding properties of commitment schemes, and we'll talk about the latter two um, in some detail later in the talk. Okay, so let's go, go talk about actually this collision resistance example now. So suppose we have a family of uh, collision resistant hash functions. What does that mean? So it's a family of functions um, um, that are shrinking. So there, that's why they're referred to as hash functions. So they say taking n bit inputs to some n minus k bit uh, outputs. Um, with the property that if I pick a random function from the family and give it to you, it's infeasible for you to find a collision in the hash function, two inputs that map to the same output. All right, certainly, think of k as fairly large, uh, even polynomially related to n. So since f is shrinking by a lot, there are definitely many, many collisions. Yet, if I give you a randomly chosen function from the family, it's hard for you to find one, except with negligible probability. OK, so now think of the following game or protocol between two parties, a and b, using this family. Party b picks a random function, f, from the family. I'll write it by a capital letter just to emphasize that it's a random variable, sends it to A. All right? Now A picks a random input to the hash function, x, uniformly at random, and then computes y, f of x, and then sends that to B. Okay? And now we're going to do something strange, but you'll see why. Uh, now imagine A sends x uh, to B. OK, so what I'm interested in looking at is the entropy of x given y and f. OK, so that's, that's the reason for this strange, uh, seemingly strange, if I'm going to send x, why do I send y at all? It's because I'm going to look at the entropy of x given y and f from two different perspectives. So one perspective is from the perspective of someone just looking at this interaction from the outside, or even from, from b's perspective. Um, I claim that x has a lot of entropy given y and f. And this is because the hash functions are shrinking. So when I take x, originally it has n bits of entropy. All right, conditioning on f doesn't reduce its entropy at all, because x and f are chosen independently. And now conditioning on y, I'm conditioning on a string of length n minus k, so it can reduce the entropy by at most n minus k. So x still has at least k bits of entropy left. On the other hand, I claim that from a's perspective, at this point, after f and y, after y is sent, x has no entropy left. Okay? So, um, and this is follows from the collision resistance of the hash function. So the fact that the hash family is collision resistant means that once a sends y, right, it can't produce, it's infeasible for a to produce two inputs, x1, x and x prime, that both hash to y. Otherwise, a would be, if a is a feasible polynomial time algorithm, a would be finding a collision in the hash function f. Okay? So um, we think of this at an intuitive level of saying that x has entropy, has real entropy given y and f, but it's inaccessible to A. Okay? Um, and so to make this more precise, we have to think not just of the, this A that I've described here, this honest A that follows the protocol, because um, you know, clearly this A it will always send the x that it's chosen. If you sort of condition on, on what a knows at this point, namely this value x, then there's no randomness left in the, in the system. Okay? So here we want to think of an adversarial a that may not follow the, the, the game as, as described here, okay? and may toss some additional coins at this point in trying to generate an x with a lot of entropy. And we want to say that that is uh, infeasible. Okay, so let's consider a cheating a star. All right, so now it receives f from b, tosses some coins, which will denote by s1, sends some value y, depending on that. It may get it by choosing an input and evaluating. It may do it in some other way. And now um, tosses some more coins, um, trying to generate get entropy in x. And the claim is that um, the collision resistance of the hash function uh, means that x is essentially determined by a's state after, after sending y, namely by f and s1. Okay? And you include y, but y is a function of, of f and s1. So that is, there's a function 
for, for every A star, there's a function mapping F, Y, and S1, that's A's state, after sending Y, to a unique value X, such that this is the value that A star will send, um, except with negligible probability. Okay? Even though A is tossing fresh random coins, is trying to generate X with a lot of entropy, it can't. Given these things, X is almost uniquely determined. All right, so one small modification, we have to allow the possibility that A sends something invalid that's not a pre-image of Y under the, under the hash function F. So what it really does, either sends this, this unique value um, that's pi of F, Y, and S1, or something that's not a pre-image, an invalid message. Okay, so here, in contrast to the um, pseudo-entropy that we talked about before, we have a situation where, where the real entropy of X, say from B's perspective, is high given, given the, the past, but from A's perspective, computationally, it looks like it has low entropy. So a difference between what we're trying to capture here and, and what was before is here the computational form of entropy is smaller than the real entropy. Okay, so now let's forget this, uh, forget this example of collision resistant hash function. Just consider this question. We want to come up with some computational analog of entropy that captures the possibility that a random variable, in, an, in a useful and interesting way, that the, that the computational and entropy in a random variable can be much smaller than its real entropy. All right, so a first attempt would be to try and do something just like the, the uh, definition of uh, Hostet et, et al. from earlier. We say a random variable x has accessible entropy, or you can even call it pseudo-entropy if you like, at most k, if there is a random variable, if it is indistinguishable from some random variable of low entropy, whose actual entropy is low, computationally indistinguishable from something of actually low entropy. And the claim is that this definition is not, not a useful one. Okay, it's not, not really an interesting one. It turns out that every random variable x is indis computationally indistinguishable from a random variable of very low entropy. Okay, and this, is, this, this can be proved um, just um, by a probabilistic method. If you take a um, slightly super polynomial number of random samples from x and let y just be the uniform distribution on, those, or on that multi-set of samples, then with very high probability, y will be computationally indistinguishable from x by, say, circuits of polynomial size, and yet the entropy of y will be just slightly super logarithmic because its support size is just slightly super polynomial. Okay? And if you want to preserve efficient sampleability, instead you could just compose x with a, a sampling algorithm for x with a pseudorandom generator and get the same kind of conclusion. Okay, so this definition is not, this Hill notion is not useful for capturing the idea that a computational entropy can be smaller than the real entropy. All right, so instead, let's try and have a definition that, that really you know, comes from thinking about this example we have. All right, so again, we'll think of, in, in the applications we're interested in are of this type, we'll think of an interactive protocol between two parties, A and B, and we want to think of it as having what we call inaccessible entropy if the actual entropy of A's messages, okay, from B's point of view, is larger noticeably larger than the entropy that A, or a cheating strategy for A, A star, can generate from, from its own point of view. Meaning, so given, given the transcript so far, the, the messages have a lot of entropy, but given the state of, of A, or the adversary, A star, um, they don't have much entropy. All right, and so we refer to this first quantity, again, it, we'll refer to it as real entropy, well, I'll be more precise but we'll refer to this as, as real entropy, and then this uh, latter quantity, or upper bound we'll, we'll refer to as the accessible entropy, or the, what is accessible by a feasible adversary. All right, so let's um, uh, now make these more precise. So we have this protocol between A and B. B sends a message B1 to A, then A sends a response A1, B2. To note that uh, random variables, for when they play honestly with each other like this, and we say that the real entropy of A's messages in this protocol um, is just the sum of their conditional probabilities, the, con the entropy, uh, conditional entropy. So the conditional entropy of 
A1 given the past, B1, conditional entropy of A2 given the past up to there, B1, A1, B2, and so on. We sum this over all the rounds. Okay. Um, one remark is, for simplicity, um, we are only considering the case that B actually follows the, the protocol. In, in general and in applications, it can be useful, and the de definitions generalize naturally, as, and, and our constructions do as well, to the case where um, you will actually talk about the entropy even when B deviates from the protocol. Well, this is a side remark for um, experts. Um, okay, so accessible entropy. Now, we consider uh, a possibly cheating strategy A star, okay, playing against B. So B sends its first message B1. Now A star, at every round, will, will toss some coins. We'll denote the first set of coins that A, A star tosses S1. It sends a message A1 to B based on that. But now, in addition, we want to, we need to capture, um, if you think back to the collision resistance example, um, the constraint that A star should send only valid messages, right? And how that's captured is that at this time, A star should also output a, a witness, W, which we'll denote by W1, that, that justifies this message as, as being a valid one. One that the honest an honest A would have sent. Okay, so let, I'll be elaborate on that. So in each round, A tosses some coins like S1 here, sends a message A1, and then privately, this is not something it sends, sends to B. Privately outputs a, a this witness uh, WI in the ith round um, that justifies the message. And in our applications, you can think of this as coin tosses for the honest A that are consistent. Um, with, the, with the, the messages that have been sent so far. That if the honest A had these coin tosses, it would have sent exactly the messages that, that I've sent. Okay? And so if someone uh, stops A star and says, you know, I think you've been cheating. Show me that you've been behaving like the honest A, uh, that, that, you're, that you're behaving honestly. He says, well, here are the, the, my coin tosses. The honest A would have sent exactly the messages I've sent if, if it had these coin tosses. Okay? And it does this at each round. Okay? And... Um, it may change its mind about what coin tosses for the honest A um, it, it would declare if you stopped it at any point in time. All right, and in application, that's ex exactly what we would do ultimately: is is stop A star at some point and say, you know, show me your coin tosses. Okay, so now we say the protocol has accessible entropy at most k, and for every feasible strategy A star. Um, the sum of conditional entropies it can achieve is at most k, but here we condition not just on uh, the transcript so far, but we condition also on all the coins that, that A star has tossed in prior rounds. So when we talk about the entropy of A2, we also condition on the coins S1 and, and so on. Okay? And this is, this is similar to what, what we talked about encryption, that the two measures of entropy are really talking about from two parties, you know, sort of different perspectives, the honest perspective and the adversary's perspective. Here it's B's perspective versus uh, the real entropy is from sort of B's perspective and the accessible entropy is from A or cheating A's uh, perspective. All right, so a couple of remarks on this definition. So um, again, we need to handle the possibility that A star may output invalid justifications Okay, and um, in some sense, what you want to do is count zero entropy in those cases when when, when an invalid justification is, is provided. Um, so we have a way of of sort of taking that into account in our measure of entropy that I don't want to get into in the talk. Um, uh, so but you want to sort of quantify it in, in, in the right way. But for the purpose of the talk, we'll just assume that A star always produces a valid justification. A second remark to show that this is really a computational notion of entropy is that if we remove the computational constraints on A star, then I claim that there's a strategy for it that achieves really the uh, who's, that achieves entropy um, equal to the real entropy. And what is this A star strategy? At each round, what A star will do is it looks at the, the history so far. It will sample uniformly random coin tosses for A that are consistent with the history so far, and then send a message based on that. Okay? And it turns out that 
then the distribution on the transcript, I mean, sorry, the, then, then this achieves exactly a distribution of next message conditioned on A star state so far, the same as the distribution of the honest A's message conditioned on the history so far. Well, this means that uh, you cannot, this cannot exist also without one-way transform. That's right. And our main, um, uh, the main step in our application of this notion is going the other direction, saying that from a one-way function, we can build a protocol with a gap between accessible and real entropy. Like uh, in Hadiyas or Levin, kind of. I'm not sure it, so. maybe I, we haven't looked into connection with in Hadiyas or Levin. Well, you talked about something, uh, A's behavior. If there were no one-way functions, you could sample that behavior of any efficient algorithm using it. Ah, 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 you're saying, okay, good, good, good. All right, so, so you're saying, all right, so this is the proof that accessible, a gap between real entry and accessible entropy, accessible entropy implies the existence of one-way functions. The one-way functions are necessary. What we've seen so far with collision-resistant hashing, um, and I'll go back to that example, that Collision-resistant hash functions imply protocols where there's a gap. So, and what we will show is from sort of a converse to what you get from policy 11, that from a one-way function, you could build something with a gap. Okay, so let's go back to this collision-resistant uh, function example. So again, we have random functions sent by B, and then A sends a uh, point in the, in the range, honestly, would be by evaluating uh, F on a random point, and then a, a pre-image. So the real entropy here, so now, okay, in our definition, notice we, here we're counting the entropy summing over all messages of A. The definition and in our applications also, it sometimes is useful to look at summing over a subset of the rounds, not all the messages of A. Um, but here, let's, let's work with the definition where we do sum over all the rounds. So the entropy of Y given F plus the entropy of X given Y and F for the real entropy. So the entropy of y given, if you look at the sum of these two things, then by the chain rule, this is just the entropy of x given f. And, and the intuition for that is that all the entropy of a's messages are contained in x, because y is a function of x. And what is the entropy of x given f? Well, x is treated independently and randomly from f, so it's just n if it's a real entropy. On the other hand, uh, the accessible entropy um, we claim is, 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 is basically n minus k. All right, so the entropy of y given f is at most n minus k, because y is of length at most n minus k. And now from what we said before, the entropy of x, given the state of a so far, that's f, s1, and y, um, is negligible because, we, as we said before, the collision resistance of the hash function implies that x is a function of these things, except with negligible probability. Okay, but we're interested this is, so sort of this example of collision-resistant hashing is really using this accessible entropy only in this sort of qualitative extreme where something is entirely determined, so the value accessible entropy is zero um, or negligible. Um, so in our applications, we'll be interested in this more quantitative measure, and we'll see how it comes up. Okay, our main applications are to constructions of commitment schemes, so let me review what a commitment scheme is. So a commitment scheme is a cryptographic analog of a, of a safe, all right, there's a, there are two stages to a commitment scheme. In the first state, so we have a, a sender, S, and a receiver, R. Sender has some uh, secret or private message, M, it wants to commit to. And the commit stage corresponds to putting the message in the safe, locking it, sending the safe to the receiver. And then later, um, if the parties so choose, they can uh, go through the reveal stage of the commitment scheme where the sender basically allows the receiver to open the safe and see the contents. Okay. So um, mathematically, what you have is a sort of two-stage uh, protocol. So in the first stage of the protocol, so the sender has this n-bit n message m. They undergo a possibly interactive protocol here where s is committing to m. That corresponds to putting the message in the safe and sending it to the receiver. And then later, um, the sender can reveal the message together with a key. Um, and this sort of corresponds to the receiver checking that M is the message that was committed to in the, in the first stage, and will accept or reject according, accordingly, whether things are consistent. Without loss of generality, this reveal stage is, is non-interactive, um, and actually can just consist of the coin tosses that the sender used in the commit stage. 
All right, so what are the security properties of a commitment scheme? Uh, there are two. Uh, one uh, that protects the sender is called a hiding property. This is a secrecy condition. It says that after the commit stage, the receiver should have no idea what the uh, sender committed to. So that a commitment of one message should be indistinguishable from a commitment to another message. And this comes in two flavors. It can be statistically indistinguishable, sort of an analogous to Shannon's perfect secrecy or statistical generalization of it, or computational hiding, where they're only computationally indistinguishable. And the binding property says um, a cheating sender is bound to, it can't change the value in the safe after the commit stage. So um, it is, uh, a cheating sender can't produce accepting valid uh, decommitments in the reveal stage to two distinct messages, except with negligible probability. And this also comes both in a statistical flavor where we require security against computationally unbounded uh, cheating senders, S star, and a computational version where you only require this for feasible polynomial time strategies. All right, so statistical security in both cases is clearly stronger than computational. You have security against even a computationally unbounded adversary. Um, but unfortunately, it's not hard to show that you can't have commitment schemes that are simultaneously statistically hiding and statistically binding. Okay, if the message is information theoretically determined at the end of the commit stage, then it, then it's, uh, it can't be information theoretically hidden if you have unbounded resources. Um, so the best you can hope for is to have uh, one condition or the other be statistical. Um, in the case of statistical binding, we've had a very good understanding of for, for a long time. Um, and specifically, the works of, of Hastad et al. that I mentioned earlier, constructing pseudorandom generators for moment functions, and the uh, work of Naor, constructing statistically binding commitments for pseudorandom generators, show that you can build statistically binding commitments from the minimal complexity assum assumption for complexity-based cryptography, namely the existence of one-way functions. Um, the other case where you want the hiding to be statistical, but uh, allow are, are happy with the binding being computational, um, <clears throat> it's only a couple of years ago in joint work with uh, Ifdak Haitner, Min Noyen, Shen Jin Ong, and, uh, and Omer uh, Reingold, uh, that we, we were able to show that uh, you can build statistically hiding commitments from any one-way function. Um, there were a series of, of earlier works showing how to build statistically hiding commitments from, from progressively weaker and weaker assumptions um, leading up to this result. Okay, but um, uh, for the purposes of, of, of this talk, so this is a previous work, purpose of this work, um, a problem with this result is that, at least from our perspective, uh, it was uh, uh, too complicated, both the construction and, and its an analysis, uh, uh, too complicated, didn't feel like the right proof of, of, of this result. So our first uh, application of uh, this notion of accessible or inaccessible entropy is a much simpler proof um, of this result, that you can build statistically hiding commitments from any one-way function. And the nice thing about it is that the, 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 the new construction and its analysis really parallels the, the construction of statistically binding commitments um, due to Hastad et al. and uh, Naor. Uh, uh, so a joke uh, 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 that Omer made is that, um, so traditionally the, the, the work of Hastad et al. Used to, be, used to be thought of as a complicated uh, result in cryptography, and our goal in this work was to make uh, make statistically hiding commitments as simple as Hill. Um, but really, from today's perspective, I think Hasad et al. is no longer really such a complicated result, and there also been some nice works recently uh, uh, simplifying the, the most uh, complex parts of it, um, you know, sort of given what we know today about our, sort of how commonly we use entropy and randomness extraction and these sorts of things. And so that's, that's more or less what we achieve, and a, um, <clears throat> uh, there are some other nice side benefits. Um, we also can achieve uh, optimal round complexity, namely n over log n, if you're starting with a one-way function on n bits, uh, for at least a non-uniform version where the honest parties require some non-uniform advice to run the protocol. And for a uniform version, we just get the square of this. Um, the lower bound that, that shows that n over log n is optimal is due to Heitner, Hawk, uh, Reingold, and Segev. And uh, this compares to the, the previous construction. There was some large polynomial number of rounds um, that was not even specified. Okay, 
So a second result, which I won't talk about in any, at, at, uh, in any detail at all, uh, regards the relationship between uh, statistically round efficient statistically high increments, so constant round ones, um, which can't be built from one-way functions, at least in a black box manner by this lower bound that I just mentioned, and round efficient zero-knowledge proofs. And specifically, it shows that NP has constant round uh, zero-knowledge proofs with black box simulation, don't worry about what that is if you don't, if you don't know, um, that remain zero-knowledge under parallel composition, if you repeat it many times in parallel, if and only if constant round statistically hiding commitments exist. All right, so one direction has been known for a long time that you can go from constant round statistically hiding commitments to constant round zero knowledge, and our main contribution is the, uh, an application of accessible entropy is to prove a converse. Okay. Um, so one thing is that we really wanted to sh show this result without assuming that the zero knowledge is closed under parallel composition, just to assume that it has negligible soundness error, and that's an interesting open problem. Okay, so um, I won't get to say much about uh, the details of the, of the first application, but let's at least see what is the connection between statistically hiding commitments and inaccessible entropy. So now again, like we did with encryption, let's think of uh, committing to a uniformly random n-bit message. And we'll let c be a random variable denoting the transcript of the commit stage. Um, and uh, m, uh, the, the value that's revealed, and then again we'll separate this from the key k, which we think of as a justification for the, the, the message m that's revealed. So what is statistical, the statistically, statistical hiding property? It says that the commit stage reveals no information or statistically no information about the message m. All right? and that can be translated into saying that the real entropy of m, given the transcript so far, given c, uh, so from, you know, from the receiver, this is capturing what the receiver sees, is nearly n, n minus negligible. On the other hand, the computational binding property says that from S, the sender's perspective, the message is uniquely determined after the commit stage. So that is, if we consider a cheating sender, we could toss some coins in the commit stage, um, and, we, and then allow it to toss possibly additional coins in the real stage, um, it can't generate, um, it's, it's stuck to basically zero or negligible entropy in M if we condition on C, on what its state so at, <coughs> after the commit stage, namely C and its coins S1. <coughs> okay? So this looks, really, this is just like um, what we were capturing with inaccessible entropy. Real entropy, very high, same as the uniform distribution. Uh, up to a negligible amount, and accessible entropy negligible, negligibly close to zero. Okay, so um, there is really a very close connection, and um, our goal is to construct that from any one-way function. And our proof really goes along very similar lines to what I mentioned about the work of Hastad et al. earlier. So our first step, starting from a one-way function, uh, we build a protocol where there's a slight gap between its real entropy and it's computationally accessible entropy. Okay, not a very big gap. Uh, it turns out it's log n bits, but the total amount of entropy we're talking about is polynomial, so it's it's uh, it's not not huge. Um, and this is uh, <clears throat> uh, using a beautiful protocol of uh, Naor, Strauss, Benke, Tyson, and Young called interactive hashing and a kind of generalization of, of Heitner and Reinbold. Um, that was used, it was used by Naur et al. to build statistically hiding commitments from one-way permutations, one-way functions that are permutations, say, on n-bit strings. Um, they showed that this construction gives a statistically hiding commitment in one shot. And our uh, observation here is that if you apply it to an arbitrary one-way function, so you may not get a statistically hiding commitment out right away, but what you get is a slight gap between real entropy and accessible entropy. And then things really parallel uh, Hassad et al. construction. We take repetitions. Um, this makes the entropy gap larger. It also converts the Shannon entropy, real Shannon entropy into min entropy. Unfortunately, it doesn't convert the accessible entropy into accessible max entropy, uh, but I don't, don't want to get too much into that issue uh, right now. And then um, we do some hashing to convert the high min entropy into almost uniform distribution, like, uh, like we want for statistically high commitment and to convert the low accessible entropy into 
kind of uh, negligible, almost zero entropy, which corresponds to binding. Um, <clears throat> and this uh, turns out you can't just use universal hashing like in Hill et al., but you can use a, a slightly interactive form of hashing, constant round protocol due to Ding, Harnick, Rosen, and uh, Chaltiel. Um, and it's, it's kind of two, two rounds of, of hashing, plus something called universal one-way hash functions, which are a, kind of a weaker analog of uh, collision-resistant hash functions, uh, which uh, can be built from any one-way function by work of Rompel. Now, you'd think that we're done, except the problem here is that accessible entropy talks about protocols with many rounds, and so you get really sort of many rounds where in every round you have either have hide, you have hiding in all the rounds, and you must be binding at least once. All right, so anyway, the, the, the catch here is you get something of, of, of kind of that looks like many commitments executed sequentially with some relationship between their security properties, and then we do some sort of simple cut and choose protocol, deciding the receiver randomly decides which one will be the actual commitment to get a standard statistically hiding commitment. Okay, so um, that's about all I'll be able to say about the, the, the proof. Um, just want to show how this really, the, especially the first three steps, really parallel what happens in the construction of pseudo-random generators and hence statistically binding commitments uh, from one-way functions, and it differs a bit in the, in the final step in uh, the two cases. Okay? Um, I won't have time to uh, talk about this first step, just the protocol is actually very simple. Um, the analysis takes a little bit more time. Basically, A evaluates the only function on the random input and then sends random one-bit hashes of, that, of the output Y to B in each round um, according to hash functions chosen by B and then reveals X. And so the protocol is simple. The analysis takes a little more time. I didn't really expect to get through this, but it was fun to make these animations. <laughs> okay, so uh, to conclude, I um, just want to conclude with a thesis that uh, complexity-based cryptography is possible because of gaps between real entropy and computational forms of entropy. And we're very familiar with this uh, for secrecy in cryptography, that secrecy corresponds to having computational entropy, namely pseudo-entropy, larger than real entropy. And what we show in this work is that there's an analog, analogous phenomenon for unforgeability conditions which correspond to having a computational form of entropy, namely accessible entropy, be noticeably smaller than the real entropy. And there are a lot of concrete open questions, um, but I just want to end with a sort of more general uh, question of what else is this? We gave a couple of applications here. Uh, what else is this notion of inaccessible entropy good for? Oh, great. Uh, so Avi asked, um, is there a definition of inaccessible entropy that can make sense not in interactive protocol settings? Um, and, we, and we were really led to this interactive protocol setting because that's the sort of applications also we were looking at were naturally interactive. Um, so we've only recently sort of started thinking about um, what other ways uh, in which you could have it. So you do need there to be some asymmetry between <coughs> when, when you want to have a gap between real entropy and computational entropy. And if your real entropy is achieved by an efficient, honest party, um, which is what, what, what you really want, um, you need there to be some asymmetry uh, in order to have this gap, because otherwise the adversary could just be the, uh, the honest, honest part. So you can't just say, I have a distribution uh, that you know, can be sampled of high entropy um, by an efficient algorithm, but can't be sampled by high entropy by an efficient algorithm, because those two, right? But you, the, you could get this non-interactive asymmetry by some sort of uh, secret key. And I think this is what corresponds if you start trying to model message authentication codes and digital signatures. So then it becomes non-interactive. So with a secret key, you have a distribution that you can sample of high entropy. So for example, I can generate um, high, uh, a random, uniformly random message together with a justification, a digital signature or a Mac of it. Um, but an inefficient, but a, uh, an efficient algorithm without the key can't generate high entropy distribution. So that seems to be the way to get a non-interactive definition is to, the asymmetry, instead of coming from uh, interaction and conditioning, whether we condition on the state or the history, we get the asymmetry by possession of a secret key and then you may have an 
Uh, yeah, so, so we do know how to simplify, or at least cast Rompels, the construction of uh, universal one-way hash functions from one-way functions in the language of uh, inaccessible entropy. I never actually have understood Rompels quite construction myself, so I can't tell you whether it's simpler or not. Um, you'd have to ask Giftak.